Vasvam, Tatsavitu Varanyam Bhago Devasya Dimahi, Dio Yona Prachodayat Om. Our salutation to that Supreme Being who is the Self and all. He is the source and sustenance of this universe. In him we live, move, and have our being. May he illumine our hearts, and may he guide us in every way. Good morning. Uh, the title of today's talk is A Life Without Regret. And uh, I generally try and define my terms before I get started, although I'm not sure that that's necessary. I'm pretty sure we all have our regrets in life. Uh, still, for the sake of precision, I would say that a regret is the memory of a past action or thought that makes the current moments unpleasant or painful. And so naturally we want to avoid these things. We don't like painful situations. And so the question is, can we? Can we live a life without regret? Is it even desirable to live a life without regret? Uh, so before I answer those questions, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we manage the regrets that we already have. I live in the Mojave Desert in a retreat center, and occasionally people drive through there on their way to something else. And so I had a, uh, a friend from my youth. There's maybe f five or ten of them that have kind of kept track of, of this trajectory of monastic life, and they show up at some monastery or another sometime. Uh, I guess they just want to see where this whole thing is going. You know, they remember me in high school maybe, and they thought I seemed more or less normal, and now I'm in this monastery, and where's what's that going to turn into? So they still kind of drop in in my life every once in a while. So I hadn't seen this one since before the pandemic. And so he came, and he said uh, that he brought up the subject of drinking alcohol during the pandemic. And uh, probably some of you know that this was a thing. People drank alcohol during the pandemic. When there was a lockdown, alcohol sales went up and people drank. And it was on the news and in the media. People joked about drinking and all that. So he brings up drinking during the pandemic. And he says, people say that I drank too much during the pandemic. But actually, I drank the perfect amount. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny at the time, uh, but it also illustrates one of our main coping mechanisms for regret, and that is denial, right? People say I have a problem drinking, people say I'm drinking too much, it's just not true. Everything's fine, I've got this, right? And. Uh, I mean, my feeling is, I don't know, I don't think he has a problem. Uh, my feeling is that he was feeling some regret over this, or he wouldn't have brought it up at all. It just wouldn't have come up. The fact that he articulated this at all means there's something lurking there that he hasn't quite made peace with. But his method of moving on with his life is to deny the existence of the problem. And I think this is something that we're all familiar with, where, whether or not alcohol is involved. And it's something that happens in religion, too. There is a uh, conversation with Swami Turiyananda that took place about 100 years ago in Varanasi, India. And the man comes to him, and his life isn't working out. His marriage isn't happy. His career is not going too well. I don't know if his kids are disobedient, stupid, and stubborn, or whatever they are. And uh, so he decides that maybe now is the time to become a monk, right? It's not working out so well in the world, so I'll just wander the streets as a holy man in Varanasi, 
right? That's his plan. And this actually illustrates one of the problems with denial, which is that we blunt our discrimination when we deny the reality in front of us, right? We cloud our judgment, right? So this, this guy has got this plan. And he brings it to Swami Turyananda. Turyananda is, of course, having none of this. And he says, so you came away leaving your family behind. You had your enjoyments yourself, and then you got away. Don't you see that this is cruel and cowardly? It is selfishness, pure and simple. And this guy has a great comeback. I thought this was really wonderful. He says, well, this is but a relative concern, the outcome of ignorance. Isn't that great? I mean, total denial. This whole world is Maya. All my actions are unreal. Everything that's going on here isn't real. Therefore, I can do whatever I want. It's all good, Swami. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right? That's his response. And Turyananda is, is uh, ready, I guess, for this because he's got the perfect comeback. He says, and your fleeing from the world is absolute. Right? He says, this is a relative concern. And Swami Turyananda says, and your fleeing from the world is absolute. It is the outcome of knowledge. <laughs> right? And yes, basically, that's the guy's position, right? He's, he has denied his situation, and he's clouded his judgment, and he has mistaken disappointment in his worldly efforts with spiritual yearning. He can't see the difference, right? So Turyananda continues and tries to instruct him a little bit. He says, to say that you are renouncing the world with the object of calling upon God would be utterly false. It is not good to give up the world simply because one has not been successful in it. There is no freedom, no respite, until you have done your duties. That which you have given up without performing will be waiting for you only to appear again. Face the brute. You cannot save yourself by flight. That's another problem with denial, right? We deny the situation and it just keeps coming up in our face again and again and again, right? If we're denying whatever, drinking, say, since I brought that one up, more and more signs from the external world are going to come to us, friends, family members, we crash our car, whatever happens, you're drinking too much, right? We'll get these reminders until we face it. So that's one method of I'd say one of our sort of little toxic coping mechanisms that we have to deal with our regrets, and that is denial. Another one that I think we've all employed uh, one time or another is what I call the alternate narrative, sort of a nice way of putting it. And that's where we make up, you know, it's the, some memory of some painful event comes up in our mind and we just make up something else. Or maybe we don't even make up something else, we just think, well, what if it went this way, right? So we don't actually say it didn't go that way, we just sort of fantasize about how it might have been different, right? Well, if we do that enough times, we start to believe our own story. We start to believe our narrative. And I don't want to get political here, but um, this whole January 6th thing that's going on in uh, Congress right now, I mean, we have an ex-president who's made an alternate narrative. There's a, a something he regrets. He lost the election, and he doesn't want that story. He wants another story. He wants the story where it was he was wronged. He won, but he was wronged, right? Another narrative. And what does it do? It absolves the ego. Right? It saves our ego, protects our ego. We didn't do anything wrong. It's their fault, somebody else's fault. And of course, I shouldn't pick on Trump because politics is uh, fertile ground for a variety of narratives, right? I mean, Putin, he's defending Russia against Nazis, right? NATO says something very different. I think in religion, probably the most famous alternate narrative belongs to Arjuna. Right? Arjuna says to Krishna that he can't kill these people because he's so compassionate and loving. Krishna says, no, it's because you're a coward. That's the real story here, Arjuna. Right? 
And so <clears throat> we all do this to some extent. We may be thinking, well, this is kind of obvious, and I know that people do this, and I don't really do it. Or maybe I've done it once or twice, but I don't really, it's not really an issue for me. But it is actually, according to Vedanta, something that we are all doing all the time. We are all guilty of this in the most fundamental way. Because what are we denying? We are all guilty of denial and an alternate narrative. First, we deny the real self. First, we deny the Atman, right? And then we come up with an alternate narrative about how I am a man, a woman, a Republican, a Democrat, whatever, you know, a, a monk, a householder. We have all these stories that we pile on top of that fundamental denial that I am the self, which we're denying all the time, and asserting this body existence and this mind existence, right? That's the idea that Vedanta gives. And so in that sense, we are all guilty of this. And of course, once you have that fundamental denial topped with these alternate narratives, they pile up on top of each other. And this person, he exists separately from me, and he said this and that, and I'm, now I'm upset about him, and my mom didn't treat me right, and now I'm going to therapy or whatever, right? All these stories get so complicated that we wind up on the, on the couch at the shrinks. And uh, so I would say that better than going to the shrink is meditation. Meditation is a great way to try and untangle these alternate narratives and pierce through these denials. I would say that meditation is cheaper, more beneficial, and easier than psychotherapy. Cheaper is obvious. More beneficial, meditation has been clinically shown to reduce stress, to reduce fatigue, to elevate our mood, to help our memory. I almost forgot that one. Haha, uh -huh, sorry. Uh, to help our memory and also helps us process information. In other words, those things are associated with cortical folding in the brain. And it only takes 20 minutes a day of meditation to actually show a physiological change in the cortical folding in the brain. 20 minutes a day. I went and talked about this at a university a few years ago, pre-pandemic. And um, one student raised her hand and she said, you know, I tried this meditation stuff and uh, I just can't do it. I'm not any good at it. And you guys may be wondering, I said easier, and you're thinking, well, okay, I'm going for cheaper and I'm going for maybe more beneficial, but easier, I said easier, I meant easier. I think meditation is easier than going to psychotherapy. Why? Well, because this girl, she says, I can't do it. So I quit, I stop meditating because it doesn't work. I can't concentrate. And I agree, to try and actually concentrate the mind perfectly, laser-like focus to the, you know, one thing to the exclusion of everything else, very, very difficult. But let's think about it for a second. These people in these clinical studies that are having all these wonderful results from meditation, right? Their mood's elevating, they're less stressed, less fatigued. They're doing it 20 minutes or more a day. What kind of a meditation is that? Can these people meditate? No, they can't meditate. They're doing what we are all doing when we go to meditate. They are failing repeatedly at meditation, right? What exactly is a failed meditation? Well, that's the one we're all familiar with, right? That's where whatever it is that you're trying to do, right? You're trying to focus your mind, you're trying to watch your breath or be the witness, whatever you're trying to do, you are invaded by a bunch of thoughts in your mind that are trying to pull you away from your meditation, right? So you're doing what you're doing, and then all these thoughts that you are not thinking, these are not volitional thoughts. These are just thoughts that are there in your head, like furniture in a room, right? You didn't think them, at least you don't remember thinking, they're just there, they're just happening. You're trying to do something else. 
And these thoughts that you're not trying to think are pulling you away from that something else. That's the experience. And then what you do is you repeatedly bring it back, okay, I'm not, it pulls you down and you get caught up in something and you go, okay, I'm gonna go back to my subject of meditation here, whatever it is, right? And you do this repeatedly, 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 and you think, gosh, you know, I'm just no good at this, right? I can't concentrate, right? That's the experience. That's the failed, so-called failed meditation, right? Which is what all these people that are having these wonderful results are doing. How does that work? Well, we could think about it a little differently. It's kind of like going to the gym. You go to the gym, and what do you do? You, you drop the weights. And then you lift it up, and then you drop it, and then you lift it up, and you drop it, right? You don't moan every time you drop the weight. It's not an accident or a mistake, right? You do that because you're building up a muscle, right? Same thing with the attention, right? It gets pulled this way, we pull it back. It gets pulled this way, we pull it back. Is nothing being developed there? Of course, something is. Our ability to direct our attention to the subject of our choice is increasing with every effort, just like at the gym, right? The bicep gets bigger every time, a little bit. And so, yes, the failed meditation is doing something. It's not just something you want to quit. And what is it doing? Well, one of the things that it's doing is by this repeated effort of bringing our attention back to the subject of our choice, we become increasingly aware of all the distracting thoughts, of all the snow, all the background stuff in our heads. We become more and more aware of it because we're trying not to think about it. And when you try not to think about something, you wind up being aware of it, thinking about it, ironically. And so we become more and more aware of the snow in our heads. And it's important to understand that it's not like that snow in our heads is just there when we sit down to meditate. It's there all the time. The difference is now we know it because we're trying not to go with it. The rest of the day, it's still there and it's still influencing our thoughts and our actions and our words. And when we think, why did I say that? Or why did I do that, right? Why did we say that? Why did we do that? Because that snow in our heads we were unconscious of, and it pushed us in some direction that was suboptimal, and now we regret it. So in other words, what I'm saying is, a great way to avoid regret is to practice this, because then we can become more and more aware of the unconscious processes that are going on in our mind that drive us to situations that we later regret, that we wouldn't have done if we were thinking clearly. So, is it any wonder that this practice would help us reduce stress, reduce fatigue, elevate our mood? Well, of course, because a lot of the things that make us sleepy, sad, and, and tired, and fatigued, and stressed out is regrets. Our regrets do that to us, right? So of course meditation is going to help. Do I think that's easier than getting in the car and driving across town to a psychotherapist's office and sitting on the couch? Certainly, I do. Succeeding in meditation is very difficult. But what does a psychotherapist do? I mean, they do all kinds of things, but they also ask pointed questions to identify our little complexes that make us do things that make us unhappy. Right? This is a big goal of psychotherapy. So anyway, this is my little meditation advertisement in the middle of this talk. Um, because we may think that we don't deny. We may think that we don't make up alternate narratives in our lives but we're not really aware of all the stuff that's going on in our minds. And so now I'd like to talk about one more. Um, this one is brooding. This is now, this is a little bit more for the more introspective person, right? So now we, we're not denying and we're not making up some story to cover up what happened. Now we've accepted it and we can't let it go, right? So now we're gonna rue the day that we did whatever we did. We're going to brood over it, make ourselves miserable, 
right? So it's interesting. I know at least uh, three of you know that in the monastic vows that we take in this order, one of the vows we take, there's two sets. There's the brahmacharya vows, swami vows, brahmacharya vows, lots of vows. One of them is, uh, I vow not to brood over past mistakes, real or imagined. Brilliant, that last part, real or imagined, right? Because we, we may not be clear to all of us, not all of the mistakes that we make that we brood over actually happened. <laughs> I don't know if that's news, but it might be. Uh, you know, we do something or we say something and we think, why did I say this to this person? And we go over it and over and over. And then we finally go to make up, make amends to the person. They don't know what we're talking about. Has that ever happened? It's happened to me. Or we relive some embarrassing moment, uh, you know, something we did. And we just, you know, over and over again, I can't believe I did this thing. It was so embarrassing, whatever. Everybody else has forgotten about it. Right? Assuming they even saw it in the first place. So we vow not to brood over past mistakes, real or imagined. I thought this was brilliant so when I took this vow. I thought, yes, brooding over these past mistakes is not helpful. And so, yes, I'm going to, well, the mind, you, know, you may take the vow, but the mind has its own idea of what it's going to brood over and what it's not going to brood over. It's got a habit. And that's one of the amazing things about the mind, is it's this habit machine. And it's in the habit of, of brooding over mistakes and making me feel miserable. And I think, well, this isn't helping anything. It's not making the mistake go away. It's not making me a better person. It's not making me happier. So I'll stop doing this. Why not? Well, because the mind has a habit. Even a self-destructive habit, the mind gets into. And it's not just brooding, it's all kinds of things. I work myself to death, I talk too much, whatever it is, you realize it and still the mind just does it again and again and again, right? And then we begin to get frustrated, right? We don't want to do this, we start to, to, to brood over our brooding, <laughs> <laughs> right? We start to hate our mistakes, we start to hate ourselves. And we can't really do that. You know, these mistakes, or these habits of thinking that we have are very difficult to overcome. And we have to be patient. Uh, Swami Vivekananda said that um, the habit that we formed a month ago is difficult to uh, change. And he says, when that is so, what to speak of those habits acquired ages earlier? Each man carries a huge burden of habit acquired through a series of past lives which blur his vision. So we have to be patient. We cannot hate our own mistakes. And you think, well, wait a minute. If I don't hate my mistakes, I may do them again. Right? Shouldn't, isn't it good not to like my mistakes? Otherwise, I'll just keep making the mistakes. Right? Well, that's not what Swamiji says. Right? That's regret. That's what we're trying to avoid. Okay? And that's not what he says. He says he liked his mistakes. He was grateful for them. Uh, he says, I'm glad I was born, I'm glad I suffered so, glad I did make big blunders. He was glad he made big blunders. Well, that's interesting. He's glad he made big blunders. Well, you think, I've read his biography. What were those big blunders? It seems like his biography reads more like a spiritual superhero in a comic book or something. He did everything right, right? He, he faced it, he beat it, he went and triumphed everywhere. What is the big blunder in this guy's life? It's a natural question. Uh, I mean, what did he do? He chants his mantra too many times? Is that his idea of a big blunder? Uh, you know, I've got real problems. I have real regrets. You know, how am I supposed to like my, you know, this is the ego defending itself, right? That's what that is. That's what that voice in the head says, well, I've got real problems. My case is different, you wouldn't understand, right? That's, that's the ego talking. What does it do? It legitimizes our misery. That's what it does. So I get to keep my problems forever because they're real, his aren't. And so I get to keep mine and, and brood over them, right? So we obviously cannot let the ego win that argument. On the other hand, it's kind of persuasive. I mean, what, what problems did Swami Vivekananda, what, what mistakes did he make? I don't know. 
Uh, and he says that we should also do this. We should also be grateful for our mistakes. Uh, let's see, what does he say? Our mistakes have places here. Go on, do not look back if you think you've done something that is not right. Do you believe you could be what you are today had you not made those mistakes? Bless your mistakes then. They are angels unaware. Okay, so we're also supposed to be grateful for our mistakes. Well, all right. If my mistakes made me into Swami Vivekananda, like his, apparently his mistakes made him into Swami Vivekananda, that's what he's saying here, right? Well, then maybe I'd like mine a lot better. Maybe I'm not as happy. I mean, he was happy with himself. He made a bunch of mistakes. They turned him into Vivekananda. Happy story, right? Well, my mistakes have turned me into something that maybe I'm not that happy about. So why would I want to be grateful for these things? Still, the ego comes back with these little arguments, right? And we can't let it win this because all it does is legitimize our misery, right? And so I thought that I would talk about one of Sri Ramakrishna's disciples who by any reasonable measure, made some legitimate mistakes and had some real regret. And uh, I'm talking, some of you probably can guess, about Girish Ghosh. That's not the only option. Sri Ramakrishna had some other wayward disciples, men and women, but Girish Ghosh is by far the best documented. He was an actor and very open about his struggles. And uh, so, for those of you who don't know, he was um, a dissolute rake in his youth. He was an atheist, a solicitor of prostitution, and a raging drunk. In fact, he was such a raging drunk that he occasionally failed to solicit prostitution. Uh, he was such a scary drunk that the women of the brothel would run from him. Think about that. Just how bad is that? I don't want your money. Just go away, right? It's not worth it, right? So unquestionably, this is a man who has made some real mistakes, has some real regrets. And after partying for a while, uh, he decides that, um, as life teaches us, that this isn't going so well anymore. Um, he has a kind of miraculous cure from cholera that puts some doubt in his atheism. And he's starting to feel like he needs help. He's starting to feel like he needs to turn his life around. He needs some spiritual guidance. He wants to look for a holy man. But he finds the burden of his past is holding him back. And he is full of regret. I will read his words because they're pretty persuasive. He says... Terrible conflicts pierced my heart through and through. That condition can be better imagined than described. Suppose a man all of a sudden is forcibly dragged to a dark, solitary room with his eyes covered and kept confined there with no food or drink. What will be the state of his mind? If you can picture his mental condition, you will be able to understand something of my own. There were moments when I was breathless with emotion. Thoughts of despair bit through me like a saw. At other times, the memory of the past was revived and the darkness of my heart knew no bounds. That is some real regret. And he earned it, right? There's no doubt. And so, here's the question. Obviously, he's gone through all the self-hatred, self-condemnation, hating his mistakes, hating himself, hating his life, hating everything, right? He's going through all that, clearly, as much as anybody. Do his mistakes have no value? Do his mistakes have no value? I think they do. Why? Because I love this guy. I love Girish Ghosh, and I'm not the only one. I've heard lots of people say over the years, thank God for Girish Ghosh, right? Why? Because he became a saint. He became a saint. Girish Ghosh, the guy who did all this stuff, became a saint. And actually, the, the founder of this Vedanta society, Swami Prabhavananda, saw him acting on the stage twice. 
And he said, this is in later life after Gerish has turned it around. He said that the man had such a spiritual presence about him that it seemed like the whole stage and the whole theater turned into a shrine when he came to the stage. Such was the force of his personality. So he really did become a saint, right? And what was it Oscar Wilde says, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. I like that idea. Um, but it seems like a lot of Sri Ramakrishna's disciples don't have that kind of a past, right? We salute the Yoganandas and the Premanandas and the Vivekanandas, right? They just seem perfect from day one all the way up to the finish line. Never blink. What if they were all like that? Don't we need a few Girish Ghoshes to encourage us? Right? Most of us are not stainless from our birth. Sri Ramakrishna even said that a lot of his disciples were perfect from their birth. He says it straight out. Where would we be if they were all like that? We would think, well, maybe I should just try some other vocation. Right? Maybe this isn't for me. I don't qualify. And so, logically speaking, doesn't it also follow that our mistakes also have value? Doesn't that also follow? Maybe difficult to see. And so, I will avoid taking the Fifth Amendment and share with you one of my own. Uh, when I was, I wanted to be a monk from when I was very young, um, and I moved in the monastery at when I was just barely 20, but I was a student at UC San Diego. So I'm living as an undergrad, and I'm uh, also living in the monastery. So I've got these two worlds, the college life and the monastic life. But my ideal was very much monastic. That's what I wanted to do. And so after about two and a half years of balancing these two, I got enticed by the college world. I thought, you know, I made some friends, a couple of guys, and they were going to move into a house. And I thought, well, this is maybe an experience not to be missed. Right? This is something that I'll, I won't have this chance again to have this sort of college experience. Right? So I thought I would do that, and I moved out of the monastery. And, uh, but I was still very much interested in being a monk. That's what I wanted to do or at least monastic. I wasn't entirely clear on that, but I wanted to be monastic, right? That was my ideal. Whether or not that actually meant wearing orange robes or not, I wasn't sure. But that was where my heart was. And so I move in with these guys, but I build a little shrine in my closet. And I go into my closet, and I meditate, and I pray, and I read the chandi. That was my thing. And, uh, you know, they knew that I was in a monastery and that I was probably a little weird. And so they just kind of then, okay, well, he goes into his closet and he's reading some book or something and whatever. You know, we just, we won't talk about that. And I noticed that after some time, my practice began to suffer. Being regular in my practice in the monastery was a piece of cake. I had a whole support structure there. Even if we don't get along with our roommates, which we never do, monastery or house or whatever, there's always something. Still in the monastery, the basic thrust, the focus of our lives was spiritual practice. It was encouraged. Getting to the shrine on time, never a problem in the monastery, right? The people who came to the monastery, they're there because they want to do spiritual something. They don't know what. Maybe they're just going to go to the garden and pull some weeds or whatever they're going to do. Well, in the house with the guys, that's, you know, well, he occasionally goes into his closet, and we just don't talk about that at best, right? Uh, or they come to study, or they come to party, or whatever they come for. They're not coming for meditation. They're not coming for God to the house. I didn't realize what a difference that made in spiritual practice. In short, one of the big lessons I learned was that if we are going to try and lead a spiritual life in the world, we have got to have spiritual friends. We have got to have spiritual friends. Uh, 
And that doesn't necessarily mean, see, what we do is we come to some place, Vedanta or wherever, and we have spiritual friends there, right? But then when we go to the movies or the beach or the concert, well, we go with some other friends, right? <clears throat> we compartmentalize our lives. That's what we do. We compartmentalize our lives, and we don't want to do that, right? We have a secular life and a spiritual life. A compartmentalized life is a sign of a divided mind. And if we want, if we have any hope of unifying the mind, we have to try and have one life integrated. No spiritual life or secular life, just life. That's it, right? And so if we are going to go to the, I mean, as spiritual aspirants, we have desires. We want to go to the beach. We want to go to the movies. We want to go to the concert or whatever. Probably we're not going to be able to give those all up on day one. We're much better off doing these things with a fellow spiritual aspirant, someone who shares our ideal in life, as opposed to someone whose ideal in life is movies, beaches, and concerts, right? We're much better off dragging one of our spiritual friends to these things. Why? It puts a sort of natural boundary on our behavior, for one thing. We relate to our spiritual friends through religion, through the divine. That is our connection with them. That is the fundamental connection, right? Other things that we do are secondary, right? This is a stepping stone to trying to see the divine everywhere because that's what we really want to do. We want to see that oneness, that unity everywhere and everything. Spending our time with spiritual people allows us to practice that and legitimately fulfill some of the desires that inevitably crop up in life, right? Swami Atishwarananda puts this quite bluntly. I don't know if you remember him. He wrote that big book, Meditation and Spiritual Life. I don't know if you've read that book, uh, but he is a heavy hitter. If you've read that book, you know that it's a uh, heavy-duty book, and he's a heavy-duty Swami. And everybody says that he was a great illumined soul. He was the guru of our Swami Yogeshananda in Trabuco, who passed away last year. Anyway, he says straight out, no one should ever take up direct relationship with others. That's it. The relationship through the divine is always safe. We are always related through the ocean of Brahman, through the substance, but there should be no such thing as a direct relation with another person in the aspirant's life. The root cause of our pain are the false relationships of our life, all this thinking that we are a man or a woman, all this earthly attitude, earthly relationships of so-called love and friendship which cannot but bring pain because their whole foundation is wrong. So here's another major way to avoid regret, right? He says any relationship, and it's also said in the Gita, any relationship that is not based on the divine is destined to disintegrate, which will bring pain and regret, right? So I would say that was lesson number one that I learned leaving the monastery. Uh, another lesson that I learned um, was that it doesn't really work. You can't really leave. <laughs> you think, well, I don't like this, or my spiritual life's a little dry, I haven't, my meditations aren't that good, or these people aren't spiritual enough for me, or whatever you think, or maybe just COVID happened and we just didn't come here and now we've gotten distracted by something else, whatever it is, right? Or we're here for a while, we meditate for a while, and we think, wow, I've, I've really unloaded a lot of my baggage. I'm thinking more clearly. I feel like I'm, I'm more capable and, and more emotionally integrated, and I could go out into the world and, and really do it, right? That's another one that happens. You know, I got my act cleaned up here in this spiritual practice, and now I've got a shot at really hitting it out there in the world. And so we go to take a big bite out of the world. 
And then we find that a lot of our teeth are missing. <laughs> That's what we find. A lot of our teeth are not there. We go to bite and it's just, it doesn't have it. Why? Other people can bite. How come I can't bite anymore? It's because once you have a taste of spiritual joy, you could say, even if you don't have a taste of spiritual joy, even if you've just practiced it enough, long enough to know that it works, even that much, if you just know that there's this real, this is real, this isn't something that somebody made up, a bunch of rules to keep an orderly society, this is real, this works, it makes a difference, I can feel it, I know it, right? Maybe we haven't had ecstasy or whatever, but we know that it's real. Once we know that it's real, from a certain standpoint, we're done for. You can't really go back and sink your teeth into the world because you know it isn't the thing, right? Those people that can really bite it and grab it and go after it with all their strength, they think it's real. That's why they've got all that gusto for it. And you find that you just don't. You just don't. And I've said this to uh, <laughs> quite a few of the novices that, that have left the monastery. I've told them, well, you know, you're going to go out there and you're going to find that it's just not what you think it's going to be anymore. Some of them come back, most of them don't. You know, you, you make do. You make the best you can of the situation. But this is another lesson I learned, that once you are convinced of the truth of spiritual life, you can't really, I mean, you can do your duty in the world in a detached spirit. You can do karma yoga in that sense, but you can't really go after the golden fleece with all that enthusiasm that you once had. That time is over. So I would say those are the two big lessons that I learned um, from my mistake. And, uh, you know, this thing about being grateful for our mistakes. Was I grateful for my mistake? No. For, I regretted leaving the monastery for years afterwards. It was a big regret for me. How could I have a waste of time? That was so stupid, you know? You had your life was so much better in the monastery. Why'd you do that? You know, over and over again, right? So yeah, it was a big regret for me. And, uh, you know, it takes time to let go of some of these things. That's a challenge. It's hard to appreciate a mistake like that that you just think was stupid. But I did learn those lessons. I did learn those lessons. But the other time, you know, that's one instance where it's difficult to appreciate our mistakes. The other one, very difficult to appreciate our mistakes, is when we make the same one a thousand times, <laughs> right? How can you be grateful? Okay, well, here's this lesson again, <laughs> right? I mean, how grateful can I be for this on the thousandth time that I've made this mistake? I can't, really. It's difficult. Or even on the other, you know, you don't have to even know the lesson. Okay, here it is again. What's the lesson here, right? I've asked that one quite a few times. Okay, here, I'm doing this again. This seems to be coming up again. What is this? What am I supposed to get out of this, right? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, at those times, I feel like we have to understand that in a certain sense, we are okay as we are. We're okay as we are with our faults. Right? I mean, I think that from this dualistic standpoint, if God wanted to make a world full of perfect people who didn't make mistakes and had no regrets, he could have done that. Maybe. Actually, it's kind of hard to imagine. Maybe he did somewhere. It's not here. At least we don't think so. We're conscious of making mistakes and having regrets. Right? So if God made this situation as it is, What does he think about our faults? Does he not like them? Does he resent them? We resent them. We don't like them, right? I'm whatever, uh, what? I'm, I'm absent-minded, um, and I forget my car keys all the time. Occasionally, that makes me, in the right situation, that can be a disaster, right? Or I don't, 
I'm shy. Um, I don't speak truth to power. And then some, I should have said this and I keep making the same mistake over and over again. Or the other side, I talk too much. I'm constantly giving my opinion on things that, that are not my business and people are getting irritated with me and I'm alienating them. And now I'm isolated and I feel alone and sad, right? Whatever it is, whatever our particular character flaw that leads to a mistake, that leads to regret is, we're the ones that don't like them. We're the ones that are unhappy about them. Does God see any fault in us? As Swami Ramakrishnananda said, God did not make any mistake when he made you. You're not a mistake. Whatever mistakes you perceive, God does not perceive those. He made you this way, right? We are okay as we are in that sense, right? But we don't understand that. How can we, how can we be okay? I mean, we have friends that we love, maybe, who have mistakes. Do we love their mistakes or, or their, their character flaws? No. We put up with those. We love them in spite of their flaws, not with their flaws. We don't love their flaws. We go, there he goes again, but I like him. He's okay. He's a good guy. He just does this thing, whatever it is, right? And so we just, you know, whatever. And then we have a relationship of love with that person in spite of their shortcomings. And so it's hard for us to imagine being loved with our flaws, to be okay in that sense, right? To actually have this idea that God made us and didn't make a mistake, that we are okay. And this is uh, what Swami Saprakashananda said. Swami Saprakashananda was the head minister of the St. Louis Vedanta Society until he died in 1979. He was a disciple of Swami Brahmananda. And he said that the love that he had from Swami Brahmananda was like nothing else that he'd ever experienced before because of this, because Swami Brahmananda loved him with his faults. He says, even when I made blunders, Maharaj was unperturbed. On one occasion, I made a bad mistake, which would have offended any other spiritual teacher. But Maharaj was exceedingly gracious. In Maharaj, I found for the first time a person who could love others not in spite of, but with all of their faults. His love drew me, and I could not get away. And so that is one of the differences between the human love and the divine love. We are loved in toto, entirely, completely. And it's something that's actually alien to us because that's not what we're used to. We're used to loving parts of people, right? And Maharaj gave the same teaching. He said, pray to the Lord with a yearning heart. Do not feel shy because you have made mistakes. Do not feel shy because you have not called on him for a long time. He is the very embodiment of compassion. He does not care about your faults. He does not care about your faults. I've chewed on that one for a long time. How could he not care about my faults? He doesn't care about our faults. I believe it, although I don't quite understand it. I believe it that God loves us with our faults, in our entirety. And so I do think that it's possible to live a life without regret. I don't think it's possible to live a life without mistakes. That's, that, to me, seems impossible. Mistakes are going to be there. I mean, like I said, I learned from mine. And from that standpoint, from that sense, we're here to make mistakes, right? We're here to learn from them. We're here to learn. And so we're going to make mistakes. That doesn't mean necessarily that we need to have regrets. I mean, if we could imagine a life without mistakes, a life where I, I sail through every job interview, I ace every test, I swish every basket, whatever it is, right? All that. You know, I, I, 
I marry the perfect partner and we have perfect children, they have perfect teeth and everything, right? <laughs> now, in that situation where I never make a mistake, would I have any understanding of people who suffer from their mistakes? Would I have any sympathy for them? I would probably become such an impossible egomaniac that I would be a, a menace to society. I would be, you know, I'd be so baffled at, at people's problems, right? Or from the spiritual standpoint, if I was so full of wisdom that I never had an error in judgments, right? Would I even be here? You know, that's something uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj said. To be here is, this is an error in judgments. <laughs> the fact that we are here shows an error in judgments. He says, human birth is a calamity. <laughs> so if he's right, I don't know. He's a you know, great illumined soul. He has this thing he says. But there's something there. It's plausible to me. Right? How can we expect from that to have a life free of errors and judgments? Right? The fact that you're here shows that you already blew it somehow. Right? <clears throat> and so, yes, I do think it's possible to have a life without regret. I think we should strive for it. Because I think regretting our mistakes is not helping us. It's not helping us overcome them. It's not helping us be happier people. And what we want to do, as I've pointed out already, we acknowledge it. Okay, there's a mistake. We don't deny it. We don't go to some, we don't make up some story about it. We don't brood on it. We acknowledge it. And then we ask for strength to move on, to overcome it, to keep growing, to keep learning, right? That's the prescription. And then you say, okay, well, what happens when I make the mistake a thousand times, right? Because we all, I don't think any one of us just makes it once with all of them and then moves on to the next one, right? At least I don't. So, granted, difficult to be grateful when you've made the same mistake a thousand times and you're getting the same lesson over and over again and it seems like you're not learning anything and you're praying for help and it seems like it's not coming. At those times, we have to try and remember that we are loved. We are loved. Not in spite of our mistakes, not in spite of our character flaws, but with all of our angularities. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. May good be tied to all. May happiness come to all. May all see the face of truth. and be fortified with the armor of love, goodwill, joy, and understanding. Om peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto us. Peace be unto all. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om, Tatsa.
Um, I don't have a bullet. I, I, I have it. You have it? Okay. I, will, I will give you the announcement. So first of all, thank you to Swami Arubay Shananda for your beautiful talk. Uh, the Swami stays at our retreat center in Pinion Hills in uh, the high desert. And now and then you have a function there also, a retreat function. Well, you want to wait until it cools off. <laughs> uh, it, so far, it's only gone to 104. Last June, we hit 112. Last July, we hit 113. So I would wait for it to cool off. <laughs> Next week, our speaker will be Swami Chid Brahmananda. His topic is not yet announced. And the following week, we have a special guest, Swami Saropriyananda. I'm sure most of you know him, either from YouTube or in person. And he'll be speaking here twice, on the Sunday the 10th and on uh, Tuesday the 19th. He's c coming back after a some trip, and he'll come back. So mark your calendars, Sunday, July 10, and Tuesday, July 19. Swami Saropriyananda will be visiting. Uh, Swami Aurupeshananda will be glad to take any questions or comments that you might have. I have the microphone here. Yes. Oh, thank you um, for this talk. Actually, it feels like a very intimate talk. Uh, it's like uh, have, having tea with God, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of feeling. Um, so my question is, I sometimes I try to um, distance myself with the real world, but I have a very um, powerful uh, like a mentor, he is very active into the world because, for, for instance, he is the producer of Academy Awards, all those major awards, Emmy Awards. So he's, uh, he, his engagements actually sometimes moved me, but I think it's maybe the, the, uh, we have that kind of frequency of uh, vibrated in different level. So I am more holding back, and he's very uh, engaging. So how to how how about your experience about that? Well, I would say that um, we all have our own path, right? I mean, as Swami Vivekananda said, as so many souls, so many sects. So each one of us is a religion unto ourselves. No two of us are going to take the same, exactly the same path to the divine, right? We've all got our own, like I said, uh, the Lord made us just so. As Jesus says in the Bible, the very hairs in your head are numbered, right? So we are all just so, and we have our own particular way of unfolding the divinity that is within us. According to Vedanta, that divinity is going to unfold. He may be doing it as a karma yogi out in the world, uh, and that may work for him. You may be more introspective. You may be more of, of a reclusive yogi type. It is said in the Bhagavad Gita that we actually be, uh, come into great danger by assuming the spiritual path of another. So uh, I would say, as Ralph, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to thine, own self, to thine own self be true. To thine own self be true. Uh, so you follow your hearts. If you feel like that's OK, if you're having some doubt about it, you know, these are questions also for a spiritual teacher. If you're having some doubt about your practice or what you're doing, you think you should be doing it differently, those kinds of questions should be brought to a, a guru. But. Just because someone else is succeeding on a certain, with a certain method doesn't necessarily mean that method is for you, mm -hmm. right? Did I, does that, that answers? Okay, very good. Yes. Thank you, Swami, for your wonderful talk. Um, so I just want to understand the difference between the two categories. So first you mentioned the guy who comes to Swami Turiyananda and wants to be a monk and in denial of his situation. And then you mentioned 
someone who stays in a monastery gets the spiritual joy. And then he feels, now I'm going to go out in the world and get a big bite. But he finds that he doesn't have that tooth anymore. So is, what's the difference between these two? Well, what's the difference? Uh, I would say they, there's a, that's a good question because there's a lot of similarities. Um, one is a sort of dissatisfaction, a uh, feeling of lack of fulfillment with the worldly pursuits, right? And so he goes off and thinks, well, maybe I should wander the streets as a holy man. Maybe I should become a monk. The other one has a certain dissatisfaction or lack of fulfillment with the spiritual life, which we all feel at some time or another. We all feel that at some time or another. Uh, you know, you struggle hard, and sometimes it's really good, and sometimes maybe for a while, days or weeks or months. Uh, you feel like you're just not getting the fulfillment that you're looking for in your spiritual practice. And so you start thinking of other options. So in that sense, they are the same, right? Uh, you know, the difference, I guess, in those two anecdotes, I'd say, is that the man, through denial, had blurred his vision to the point where he actually mistook, it seemed from the reading, I mean, we don't really know the inner workings of his mind, but it seemed like he genuinely confused his uh, disappointment with worldly life for spiritual awakening. That's what it seemed like, the way the Swami addressed it. You know, don't you see that this is just selfishness? Like the guy couldn't see that, right? It seemed that way. In the monastery or spiritual life, and we're obviously not all in the monastery, you're practicing your spiritual life and you get distracted by something. It may not even be that you're discouraged or having a dry spell. Maybe you just see a really good opportunity. You know, that happened quite a few times in the monastery. I remember one guy showed up and uh, this, the girl of his dreams, the day he came into the monastery, she was the one who broke his heart. She dumped him and, and he loved her and, and that was years ago. And, and he comes to the monastery, he's going he's gonna to move in with us for a while. And that day, the day he moves in, she calls from his, his past, you know, hey, come back, I want you, you know. Um, that's not an isolated incident. It's remarkable how many times I've seen people come into the monastery and get pulled by something. Another guy had not only the girl, but also the job and her father, who was, had this dream job and the girl and everything, and it was also right there for him, you know. These distractions come. Temptation, it comes. That's another one that pulls us from our spiritual practice, right? Uh, and so we get baited, or we, you know, either one. We get baited or we get frustrated. And then we decide, I can do this. I, this time, I've got it, right? I'm going to go take a bite out of it. And, and uh, from what I've seen, myself and in others, uh, that ends in disappointment. Yeah, so I don't know. Does that give the difference between those two? One of them is rooted in denial. The other one maybe isn't quite so much. Maybe, but like I said in the beginning, Denial and the alternate narrative are something that we all share in the sense that we are denying the self and supplying ourselves with this alternate narrative that we are historical men, women with personal narratives and all these things, right? And they're happy or sad or whatever. <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much for your message today. Um, my question is, um, if, um, you know, there are people in my life, like, you know, who are narcissistic, and like in my family, mm. you know, mm. and like in my, uh, my college, somebody who, who I knew from college, uh, my college sweetheart, who I've known for 50 years, um, does that mean that I was a narcissistic <laughs> psychopath in my past life? <laughs> And it's just like, you know, like a coworker who I get to meet again in a party who's calling me all the time. So I, I don't know, you know, and I, I just don't know why they were um, like born this way, really. And I know, and I love my sister, you know, but mm. 
hey, you know what, she took all away my, uh, my insurance, you know, and <laughs> my insurance, I mean my, my inheritance, mm. but I still love her and I know she's never going to change, you know. And my college, um, you know, who I decided not to ever see again, who I've known for 50 years. Yeah, so I don't know why, why they were born this way. The, uh, and well, right there in my life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, your first, uh, there was one thing you said at the beginning, why do I have these people around me? And there, that reminded me of an anecdote that Swami Vivekananda gave about a, a, a baby and a thief. I don't know if you've ever heard this one, but um, uh, there's a baby in a room lying there and, and next to a bag of gold. And a thief comes into the room and he takes the gold. And Swami Vivekananda's point is, does the baby see any thief? The baby doesn't know there's a thief. Why? Because there's no thief in the baby, right? So in that sense, in that sense, when we find ourselves, we, we see flaws in others, it means we have that flaw ourselves. We may have overcome it. It doesn't necessarily mean that I am, you know, because I see this or that thing that I'm subject to it. Uh, but it does mean that at some level, if we didn't have it in ourselves, we wouldn't see it in another, is the point, right? But, um, and that is also something uh, that is big teaching in Vedanta, that if you want to reform the world, if you want to make the world a better place, what you try and do is reform yourself. If you can really reform yourself, really change the contents of your mind, you will find that the world stands reformed. Because when you have purified your mind, you've eliminated all the thieves from your mind, all the narcissistic people from your mind, all the dishonest politicians from your mind, when it's all gone, when your mind is pure, you are living in a different world. And you say, well, that's just a dream world. I've purified my mind, and, and what's really happening here is a bunch of junk, I'm just, not aware of it because my mind is so pure, but it's not quite that simple, right? Because life is contagious, right? When we are pure and we are full, you are filled with love at that point. You know, when you get rid of all these ideas of narcissistic people and angry people and cheating people and all these kinds of people, which we have, all of us to some extent, it fills us with freedom and we are free from that. When we're free from that, we feel joy and love naturally, and that joy and love that we feel when we free ourselves from that, other people feel when they come next to us, when they get close to us, right? So it isn't that we're just living in a dream world by purifying our minds and not seeing the evil that is in front of us, right? We are not just living in a dream world. We are closer to our real nature that we all have, that real divinity within us. It is shining forth into our minds, into our lives, and into the lives of others. And so yes, that is the ultimate goal, is to purify ourselves so that we don't see these things anymore. It's a tall order. It's a tall order. In the meantime, patience. Just like you have, just like you said, patience. You love your sister, you understand some of her limitations, you don't dwell on them, you don't brood on them, right? So we'd be patient, understanding. We are all God's wounded and gimpy children here. And we've all, you know, she's got her issues. I've got mine, you've got yours. We've all got our blind spots. So we try and be patient and sympathetic. Ultimately, the goal is purification, where we are no longer even conscious of the limitations of others. And we are so full of love and joy that we are a blessing to anyone that comes near us. That's the goal, yeah. May we all have that. <laughs> yeah. Had enough, okay. Well, thank you very much, always nice to see you. Okay. <clears throat> Do I go to the front now? Go to the front. I go to the front, okay. Greet everybody. And greet everybody, okay. I'm still new at this. Thank you.